Okay, let's uh, let's go ahead and start. Front Row provides insurance and risk management consulting services for the entertainment industry. We operate out of seven offices across Canada and the U.S. Our senior account executives have 20 plus years of experience providing expertise wherever and whenever needed. Front Row specializes in providing insurance solutions for a number of sectors, uh, including musicians, uh, including uh, tour liability, uh, producers of documentaries, uh, commercials, music videos, film and television, uh, equipment rental companies. Um, we also do insurance for live theater uh, and concerts and venues. But of course, the focus of today's webinar will be on, uh, on the musicians aspect of, uh, of what we do. So just uh, to introduce, uh, I am Grant Patton, VP of Marketing at Front Row, and, and I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, I have about seven years experience in the insurance industry. I previously worked at CSIO, which is an insurance uh, industry member association in a communications role, and I joined Front Row um, uh, last year. And I'm a graduate of Ryerson and U of T. Diane Konechny, uh, Executive VP, Toronto branch, branch Manager at Front Row, began her insurance career working in claims and then moved over to being a broker in 94. At that time, she was doing commercial insurance for several large insurance brokers. In 99, she began working for Jones Brown, focusing on insurance for the entertainment industry. Uh, Diane had a passion for the industry and had studied film and television in school. Diane moved over to front row when the entertainment division from Jones Brown joined with Focus Insurance and she continues to focus on providing uh, policies for large and small productions and, and any entertainment related industries. Uh, Anastasia Smallwood is, is a talented creative writer, public relations professional and engaging public speaker uh, and experienced uh, event manager who is brand and community manager at ECMA. Uh, thanks for arranging this webinar, Anastasia. So our, our agenda for today, Diane will uh, start with uh, talking about instrument insurance. Uh, we'll go into some tips and tricks around guarding, uh, guarding your gear, and we will talk about uh, specific kinds of instruments as well. Um, protecting your instruments at home, protecting your musical instruments at airports, on tour. Uh, we'll talk about guitars, drums, keyboards, violin, saxophone, best practices around protecting those. We will talk about the front row ECMA instrument insurance program as well. We will touch on musical tour insurance. We'll have a little discussion of claims. And then there will be time for uh, questions to ask Diane uh, at the end of the webinar. So some housekeeping here, and um, if you do have questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box found in the GoToWebinar panel, control panel, which should be displayed on the right of your screen. Um, note, please remember to send questions to organizers only, otherwise your question will go out to the entire audience. Uh, you can click the arrow at the top left of the control panel to move the panel in and out. Uh, also, if you're interested, you can download a copy of these webinar slides uh, by clicking under the handouts drop down uh, in the GoToWebinar control panel, and you can download the PDF there. So to provide a disclaimer here, uh, the information provided herein is to be used as a general reference only and is not intended as advice for any particular situation. In all cases, actual coverage is subject to policy language terms and conditions of the long-form policy documents issued by the insurance companies. And with that, I will let uh, Diane go ahead and take over. Great. Thanks, Grant. Um, so we're going to go through a few things, as Grant mentioned, on uh, different coverages and then different things that you need to look out for as musicians um, with regards to your instruments. Um, so basically, you know, we want to talk about why insurance is needed for your musical instruments. And, you know, the obvious thing is, is if 
they're broken, lost, stolen. Um, you want to protect yourself so that you can actually purchase new equipment to continue what your operations are, be it a musician or in a recording studio. Um, so you want to have that in place. Then there's also unexpected costs that could come up, <clears throat> which would be if you have lost or you have your equipment stolen and let's say you are playing a gig somewhere, you obviously need to have a new piece of equipment. So there's the potential that you could rent some gear uh, until yours is replaced. And also if you have uh, high valued instruments or something that's um, unique, then you obviously won't be able to get that same exact thing back. So there's an opportunity under the policy to cover it for what's called an agreed value basis, mm -hmm. um, meaning what the, uh, the instrument itself is valued at um, by an appraiser. Um, so we wanted to give some tips and tricks to guard your gear. Um, one of the reasons we want to look at this is, you know, not everything is covered by insurance. There's always exclusions on insurance policies. Um, so there's things that, you know, you'd want to do yourselves to protect your gear, not only because you don't want the things to get lost or damaged, um, but also because, um, you know, if there's something excluded on a policy, um, you know, that would be something that would, uh, you'd have to be, paying for yourself or else there's always a deductible on a policy so this will also keep you from having to actually pay out a cost for that so a lot of times we see things that are stolen out of vehicles so some tips that we have is you know obviously if you have a car if you have tinted windows or a low-cost security film um, if you're going to keep your gear in your vehicle um, this keeps them out of sight uh, avoid having band stickers on your vehicle and instruments just in case, um, you know, people are looking out for that kind of stuff and they can target your gear. Uh, if your vehicle has a back door, back window, again, this is probably with anything, not just v just um, your instruments, but if you back it up close to a wall, so it makes it difficult for someone to get in. Um, and when you are loading in or loading out of a vehicle, it's important to have someone by the vehicle at all times to watch out to make sure there's no one who can quickly snatch and grab and run away with your your gear. Um, you know, if it's possible to, to chain all your gear together in a vehicle, so if you are leaving it in the vehicle, um, you know, it's harder for people to actually get the stuff and run away with it. Uh, one of the questions we usually get asked a lot is what happens when something gets stolen? How do I prove that's my instrument or my gear that I'm using? Um, so the important thing is to keep your records. So if you're buying something, um, you know, to keep the receipts or if you're buying it from an individual through, um, a, you know, eBay or something like that, um, to keep the record of the, the transaction um, so that there is something you should, you know, something be stolen or or damaged so you can prove it you know take pictures of your instruments this way you have something to show the adjusters when you're talking to them at the insurance company uh, keep a record of all your serial numbers and uh, store copies of any of appraisals that are for instruments that are older than five years old um, or any vintage gear and that way the, uh, the you have a record of what the value of that item is Protecting your instruments at home, um, you know, people will think that something is safe at home, um, but there are, you know, times obviously that there are break-ins or anything like that happening. So if you create a safe room in your home, um, just putting a deadlock on it, if you purchase a high quality travel cases that protect against uh, impact or moisture, um, because some things again like moisture is not something that's covered by an insurance policy. Um, by cable lock, uh, sorry, a cable lock and cable and cable your cases together in the safe room. Um, if you can't have an, an alarm system and deadbolt installed, uh, a lot of times an insurance company, if you have a lot of gear and high value gear, they're actually looking for a location to have an alarm system in place. Um, and if you're selling a musical instrument through Craigslist or some other private forum, always check that the method of payment is legitimate and meet in a public place. Uh, airports are obviously a good place for people to steal things because you're distracted. Um, so some things that we want to look at are, you know, you never check your instruments with your luggage unless the airlines won't let you do that. Um, you can arrive at the airport early so the instrument can be searched and then repacked. 
uh, use proper traveling cases such as hard bodied foam lined Pelican cases or other brands that are designed to carry your particular instrument on the road. Keep watch on your instruments while at the airport terminal. Um, you can consider using a Velcro strap to attach it to your trolley to prevent a snatch and grab and hiding a towel or a similar tracking device in the cases um, you know, can result in good recovery rates for stolen gear. Um, you, you know, one of those things that you'd want to look for, especially is for vintage gear, because that's not as easily replaceable. So now we're going to look at some individual instruments that, um, you know, could be sensitive to certain things. Um, so where to keep your guitar. So, you know, looking, storing your guitar in a room closer to the center of the building rather than nearing an outside wall, this helps maintain constant temperature. Um, even if you sit while you're playing, uh, if you have a strap on, uh, you can prevent your guitar from dropping to the ground. Um, obviously, a belt buckle or something similar to that, um, you know, can scratch the guitar if it's rubbing against it while you're playing. Uh, if you keep your strings clean, it'll help protect them when you make the life of your strings last longer by wiping them down with a cloth or towel. And if traveling with your guitar, consider uh, stepping in in case with some extra padding, um, just to pack it tightly and prevent it from slipping around and moving. Um, again, a lot of these things aren't covered by insurance policies, so it's something that, you know, this will protect you, um, you know, from, from unintended damage. As drums would be the next thing we wanna look at. Um, if you're storing drums for an extended period of time, leaving the heads or under moderate tension would be best for them and keep them in shape. Uh, you might want to look at getting some hard cases, um, you know, for the shelves for each drum. If you're touring on your own, you want to bring your drums and bags with high quality zippers and some padding. Uh, then you'll want to look into some fiber cases. Um, and you'll want to remember to label each case with your contact information. And rather than checking drums as excess baggage, again, consider flying them as air freight cartage. This will cost a little more, but as the benefit of having your gear handled more professionally, otherwise look into renting a drum kit in the area your gig is instead of flying your own kit across the country. Uh, with keyboards, you want to again look at keeping it in a room with relative humidity, usually between 40 and 45 percent is ideal for keyboards. If you use a multimeter to check the electrical outlet you're plugging the keyboard into, um, just to make sure it has the proper voltage recommended by the manufacturer. If you use a regular cotton cloth to keen, clean the keyboard, sorry, uh, don't use a thinner as it can remove the printing and even damage the keys. Um, put any nearby drinks on a side table, not on top of the keyboard panel. Protecting your saxophone. Uh, so where to keep your saxophone? Uh, again, it's the temperature issue. If you never keep the saxophone in a hot or very cold area, store the saxophone in a dry place or at room temperature. Uh, always hold your saxophone by the bell instead, uh, oh, sorry, because that's the sturdiest part of the sax, um, and it reduces the chances of, of it dropping. Use a tooth patch bite cushion on your saxophone mouthpiece. This will help protect your saxophone and perhaps even more importantly, your teeth. Uh, use an X-strap to move the sax weight from your neck to your shoulders. It provides extra stability and reduces the chances of falling or dropping. And uh, swab your sax with playing silk swabs in particular and, because those can be effective. And now we're on to the violin. Um, again, humidity is an issue with these, so keep it, um, you know, in an area that is not too hot or too cold. Um, it can be affected by the environment, so, um, you know, if it's in a stable environment, it's, it keeps better. Uh, consider getting a room heat humidifier or a moisture regulator for your violin. Slacken the bow before storing it. Um, having unnecessary tension on the violin bow can destroy uh, the delicate chamber. Uh, don't allow pets to get near your violin. Dogs in particular may be tempted to chew on the violin, which of course should be prevented. Uh, get a violin case cover, ideally waterproof, so that if you put your violin, it'll protect it from dust and water. 
All right, so now we're gonna get into the insurance portion of the webinar. So members of the East Coast Music Association have access to a special program that we have for music professionals who are Canadian residents. Uh, the policy is a yearly policy and coverage is provided throughout Canada and the US. Uh, your equipment and gear is covered for replacement costs for theft, damage, fire, and loss of use. And because it's a program, it allows uh, you know us to provide this policy and this program to you for industry low rates. Um, so it's basically like buying in bulk. Um, so you can go to our website and you'll see a link to the musician's uh, um, policy and you can click on the link and add in your information and it'll provide you a quote right away. Um, a lot of things that people have a misconception about is because they think their instruments are um, covered by their homeowner's insurance, but most homeowner's policy will exclude anything any equipment or articles that are used for professional or uh, our business purposes. So if you have them in your homeowner's policy, um, and there's also restrictions for musical instruments in mo most homeowner's policies, so you should look at getting a separate policy for um, your equipment. Um, and you wanna make sure, you know, again, go back to your homeowner's policy if there is any any kind of coverage um, that is probably not gonna be sufficient for your limits. So you can go to our website and like I said, fill in the information. It's fairly quick and simple and it'll give you a quote right away and you can actually purchase it online. Okay, a lot of times you're gonna find, um, or a common question you're, people are gonna think is that, you know, what's the cost of the insurance? So the cost of the policy for these, for the musician's policy is based on the actual value of property that you're insuring. And if you need liability insurance on the limit of insurance that you're looking for. Um, a lot of insurance companies will have minimum premiums. Um, you know, some of them will start at 500, some of them are 2,500. Um, we have a very uh, low minimum policy. Um, so again, if you take a look and fill out the information, it'll give you a quote. Um, and if you have an office or have some office contents in your home that you use for business purposes, um, it can also be covered under the policy itself, because again, some of those things might not be covered by your homeowner's policy. Uh, are valuable papers and accounts receivable covered? Um, and then is there coverage for musical instruments um, or board musical instruments and musical equipment included? So we'll go through some of these things. Uh, so, where and when is the equipment covered? So, the coverage under our policy provides uh, coverage for your musical in equipment and instruments. Um, basically, it's what's called an inland marine form. So, basically, it means it can go anywhere um, in, tra in transit. So, it's not just necessarily insured at, the, at your residence or a studio. Um, so, it can cover you while you're going to a gig or away from your pre premises anywhere in the world. Uh, no, there's no coverage if you actually rent or loan your equipment to other people. Um, it's covered while it's, you know, being used by you for your purposes. And also note that the policy contains a, an exclusion for theft from an unattended vehicle. So what we had talked about before about keeping someone at, by a vehicle when it's being loaded or unloaded, you want to make sure that's always done because the only, uh, if it's something's covered or Store, stolen from a vehicle, sorry, um, there needs to be um, a, a obvious um, showing that someone has actually broken into the vehicle, that the vehicle was actually locked. Um, so when we said that, when I said it was covered anywhere in the world, there are certain countries that uh, the insurance company can't do business in, so there are certain sanctions. So any, any uh, country where there's a sanction by the governments of Canada or United States of America, um, that's where there wouldn't be coverage. So a place, you know, common one that everybody might travel to is Cuba. Um, so that's something to, to think about and look out for. Uh, you know, a lot of times people ask us if they require a schedule of, of your equipment. Um, and we actually don't require a schedule of equipment when you're purchasing the coverage. Um, the insurance company, if there is a claim, will look for that information. Um, but at the time that you're putting the coverage in place, it's not required. 
Um, the only time exception to this is if you have vintage instruments or anything that has a high value, you'd need to get an appraisal for it. And then we would need a copy of that appraisal and that appraisal needs to be updated every five years. Uh, there is something on uh, most insurance policies that's called a co-insurance clause. And basically what the co-insurance clause does is if you're not insuring your property to its full value, or sometimes it'll be an 80% or 90% co-insurance clause. So if you're not insuring it to 80 or 90% of its value, whatever um, it's stated on the policy, then uh, you would be penalized in the event of the claim. So a lot of times you'll find people will do this if they don't think all of their equipment's going to be in one place at one time. So if they only travel with a portion of it, they'll they'll travel with that, uh, or sorry, they'll insure that portion of the equipment itself. Um, but if there is a large loss, the insurance company has the right to come in and audit and to get all the information on everything you own. And if you're insuring it for only 50% of what the actual value is, then you would uh, potentially only receive 50% of the damaged or stolen amount. So it's definitely really important to insure for the full value of the replacement of all your equipment and gear. Um, we do have some coverage enhancements on the policy. So the coverage territory, again, as I mentioned, is worldwide, except anywhere where there's uh, jurisdictions or sanctions um, by the Canadian or US government. There is some coverage at, for office content. So again, if you have any office furniture, uh, photocopiers, office supplies, anything like that, um, and this is again, even in your home, uh, the policy covers you up to $10,000. And there is $10,000 coverage for rental reimbursement. So again, this is what I'd mentioned before. If you have lost or damaged equipment or instruments, it allows you to um, be reimbursed for the cost of rental until your um, piece of equipment or instrument is replaced or repaired. Uh, one of the coverages that's available under the program is commercial general liability coverage. Um, this covers you if they, you cause bodily injury or damage to a third party's property. So this would be an individual outside of yourself or um, you know anybody who's working for you. Uh, and it also includes the cost of a lawyer to defend you if you're sued. Uh, the general liability policy under this program um, that you can purchase online doesn't cover you for touring exposure. Um, and it also not cover you for com commercial music recording studios. Now, that's not to say that we can't obtain that coverage for you. Uh, there are just some additional questions that we'd have to get um, you to answer for us, and then we separately go to the insurance company, and there's just uh, usually an additional cost for that. Um, and it'll be based on for uh, commercial music recording studios on the actual revenue that you are um, getting from your operations as a recording studio. And for touring, we'd need to look at what you're actually, where you're going and how many dates there are. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions about what a tour is and the way the insurance company has defined it is it's a series of pre-scheduled performances in different cities performed by an artist or group over a series of weeks or months. So it's something that's actually set out and planned. It's not, um, you know, you're playing a gig at a bar one day and then, you know, a gig at another bar in three weeks. So this would be a series of actual performances. <clears throat> Um, now, there are certain things when you're going on a tour, which is why the insurance company wants more information. Um, you know, you want to know what the security is, including any barriers, if it's a larger venue, uh, if there's on-site medical, the staging and lighting, uh, the vendors, and, you know, there's other things that, you know, could potentially happen during a, a, a concert or event. Um, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of things where staging has been an issue, um, so there is a lot of questions surrounding that um, when it comes to putting on events yourselves. Uh, it's not as big an issue if you're going to an existing event that has its own stage, but if you are setting up at a venue and erecting a stage and lighting and things like that, then there's a lot more questions that come with that. 
Um, we do provide policies for touring musicians in Canada and the US. And, um, you know, it depends on if you're doing a, a one event or we can look at an annual policy if there is a regular tour that's going on. And there's other coverages like cancellation insurance. Um, and again, the general liability is a big portion of that. Um, so when a claim happens, there's you know certain things that we recommend that an individual do. Um, and there's certain information that we actually need to provide the insurance company uh, to actually start the claim process. So, you know, one of the big things is we need to know uh, the date that the occurrence happened. Um, so in the case of damage, obviously, um, you know, the date that something was dropped or was broken in some way, if it was stolen, the date that it was stolen, and we would need a police report for um, indicating that date. And we need to know what happened exactly, because that's how it's determined what coverage is in place for it, uh, where and when it happened, and if there is a estimate on the amount of the loss. So again, if it's something that's potentially totally damaged or if it's stolen, um, what the replacement value of that item is. And uh, we'd obviously need the name and phone number of any of the people who are gonna be the contacts for the insurance company to, to look and discuss the claim. Um, if possible, the incident should be reported to us promptly. Um, you know, all coverages are going to have a deductible, which is applied to each claim. So uh, each loss or occurrence is determined to be a separate claim and subject to a separate deductible. So if, um, you know, a situation where something is damaged slightly um, on one occasion, but it's not enough to make a claim out of, but then there's another damage that occurs at a separate time, those things, two things can't be combined to make one claim because each occurrence is, again, a separate claim. And then who should you call if there is a loss? So depending on, you know, what happened, um, obviously if it's a theft or, or something like that, then there needs to call the authorities uh, and uh, the police. And if, obviously, if there's a fire or anything like that, you'd want to call, um, you know, the fire department or, or any other as you can hear, the siren's probably outside. <laughs> uh, it's good timing. Um, so you can uh, call any any kind of department um, that provides the respective services that you're going to need. We couldn't have timed that better, I don't think. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the things that insurance policies and insurance companies want you to do is take any immediate action just to repair, um, it, to make any repairs or protect the, the um, property itself from further damage. Um, so as long as the claim is covered, the, the cost of temporary repairs to prevent further damage um, would, would likely be something that's covered and it's money well spent. Um, so you want to do that and document any of the forms of bills or receipts or photographs um, so that you can provide those to the insurance companies to verify the damages and the repair costs. Um, so basically after any type of loss, you wanna take the steps to protect your property from further damage. Again, photograph the damage, um, and then uh, you can call your insurance brokers, which would be us. Um, you know, We take the information that I mentioned previously. Um, then what will happen is the in, we'll report this to your insurance company and the insurance company will assign an adjuster. Uh, they will be looking to get any copies of reports, again, the police reports, fire, fire department reports. Um, they'll also look for documentation on your ownership of the property, any estimates for repairs or replacements. And uh, again, the adjuster will communicate what they need from you um, to proceed with the claim. Uh, just know that these policies are reimbursement policies, so basically they're looking to you to pay the individual amounts themselves for the repair or the replacement, and then you're reimbursed for the cost. Um, as I mentioned before, things, uh, instruments that are rare or, um, you know, potentially signed by someone or older, um, you can value them on an agreed value basis. Uh, other instruments or equipment can be provided on a replacement cost basis. Uh, right now, our online program will provide for a replacement cost basis. If you need something on an agreed value basis, you just need to call our office and we can arrange that for you. Um, 
So what basically what replacement cost is the cost to repair the item uh, or replace it if the damage to the item is not um, or makes it not repairable or if the cost to repair it would be higher than the uh, cost to replace the property. And there's no deduction for depreciation on that. Um, and as I said, if you have a vintage or one of a kind piece of equipment, uh, you can do it on a create value basis. Um, again, we need the appraisal for that by a reputable appraisal company. And we need to get an updated appraisal every five years um, to keep the agreed value on the policy. Uh, if you don't do that, then it's actual cash value, so which takes into account depreciation of the item. So again, if something's older, they would be looking at it as an older item, not based, it, based on the actual um, value of it. So that brings us to the end of the webinar. Uh, if you do have any uh, additional questions, feedback, or if we didn't have time uh, to answer questions that you may think of later, feel free to email the email that you see here on the screen for the Toronto uh, office. And we do have someone in Halifax as well. You can find his contact information um, on the website on the Contact Us page. Or if you'd like to contact ECMA, that's Anastasia's email on the screen as well and consider following front row insurance on facebook and or twitter if you haven't yet and thanks to diane for an informative presentation and of course thanks to ecma for partnering with us uh, on today's webinar uh, the webinar has been recorded and a youtube link to the recording will be made made available on front row's youtube channel and uh and it should likely be on the ECMA website uh, as well uh, soon. So assuming the feedback on this webinar is, is positive, we will likely do more webinars in partnership with ECMA uh, in the future. Uh, so be on the lookout for those. And thanks for listening, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.